the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Today we're out at History Acres with Jeremy and Felicia who've welcomed us back again. Guys, who are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're talking about black Java chickens. Okay, well before we talk about the chickens, why are they here? What's your mission here? Yeah, so we really started our farm in 2018 and our goal is to preserve history. So we focus on heritage breed animals, particularly ones that are on the Livestock Conservancy's endangered list, and ones that are some of the earliest breeds from America. So Felicia, both from a history standpoint and a Livestock Conservancy standpoint, why did you pick Javas? Yeah, so really we picked them for two reasons. One, they're the second oldest breed in America, um, and that's worth preserving. And two, they're really endangered. So the Livestock Conservancy has a scale of how endangered the different heritage breeds are. And it ranges from critically endangered to a watch. And actually at the last census, the um, Java chickens moved from being threatened to critically endangered, which means there's less than 500 in the U.S. Wow. So Jeremy, before we talk about extinction, let's talk about history. Mm -hmm. Put these Javas in American history and put them on the Civil War farm for us. So black Javas have a very interesting history and very rooted in America since they're considered the second oldest American poultry breed. So putting them on the, the time frame, we're talking well before the 1840s. They first show up in print starting around 1841, looking at books and breeder directories and newspapers. Like so many 19th century breeds, their their origins can be a little bit of murkiness. And I think some of that comes from the fact that people weren't taking the time to necessarily document these barnyard birds, barnyard animals. Uh, they had other things to, to deal with. Um, in addition to, like we see in drill manuals and cookbooks, there's a lot of plagiarism that took place. People just kind of copy and paste things into their own books, so wrong information could easily get repeated. That said, there are two possible origin stories for the Java chicken arriving here. Uh, the first one says it goes back to 1835. There was a sea captain who went off to the East Indies, specifically the island of Java, found some clean-legged black birds and brought them back with them uh, and gave them to a family, a friend of his that lived in Massachusetts. And from there, they spread all across the country. I mean, once you get into the mid 19th century, a little further, you can find references to black Java's east, west, north, south, spanning the country. Well, we've got a New England, a Massachusetts story. What's the other creation story? Yeah, so the other one comes out of Missouri. Um, and it's found in different publications, but I found a newspaper article in 1895 coming out of New York that was printed that told this whole story, um, where this gentleman had these Java chickens in Missouri. He was the one that had them, he loved them. Everyone thought they were amazing chickens, but he wouldn't give them to anybody. And then a coachman that he employed stole three eggs and then gave them to a family that was moving back to New York State. And then they hatched these three eggs and then the Javas really spread across the country from there. Um, the newspaper article ends by basically saying this story explains nothing because they couldn't have just sprung from the ground, even from the fertile Missouri soil, <laughs> which I found funny. And the fact that as I was reading the story, I thought this isn't really an origin story mm. um, because they started, where did they come from to make it to Missouri? So I sort of think maybe both stories might be true in some way. Well, if the origination is somewhat murky, talk to me about how these Javas are around the country at the time of the Civil War. Uh, the first poultry show was in 1849. Javas are listed in, in the articles printed about that first poultry show. Yeah, the, the value of those shows were the start of what I think exists today with there's all these different breeds and the dedication that people can get to individual breeds, the taking this bird and perfecting it, um, that all starts in the 1840s and into the 1850s. So by 1851, um, you can find them that they're showing up as a breed listed in some of the poultry books that are available at that time. And we've seen article, I mean, we're in Michigan, down south, they, they were all over the place. But they, they are a great farmyard bird. Like what farmer wouldn't have wanted these birds on their farm and, and for various reasons. So let's talk about those reasons people today won't know. Why would a farmer during the Civil War want this bird on their farm? Mm -hmm. yep, so they're a larger bird. When you're looking at a rooster, you're looking at probably 
10 pounds. Um, a hen's what, seven, eight pounds. So they're a larger bird when you think about the, the, the Dominique, which was also a popular bird in early American history. They were much smaller. So it's a large bird, uh, more meat then. They are considered good layers, but on the very light side today, but in the 19th century, it would have been enough to supply the family. And how many is that a year? About what, 180 eggs a year. When you're talking about a modern chicken today is doing 300 plus. So you can see sort of the evolution of that. But if we compare it to a Dominique, somebody else in its same era, how does it can stack up there? Um, it's a little lighter than a Dominique as well, which is interesting. The, the Black Java and the Dominique were combined to create a lot of the breeds that exist today. And part of that was uh, the Dominique's laid more, so let's get more eggs and the Java grows bigger. So let's put them together to you know, make the ultimate farm bird chicken. Let's stay with the Java's Felicia. Talk to me, What? let's talk about the Java. Um, how do we decide what a bird should look like? Yeah, so the Java, um, really you wanna look at the breed standard for the Javas. And, and, and what is a breed standard? So a breed standard is really like the set of guidelines for what your chicken should look like, what characteristics they should have. Things like what style of comb, what color of legs, what their feathers should look like, what the shape of their body is. Really, it's just your guide of, you know, if you follow this, this is what a Java looks like. What traits do I need to have a black Java? Yeah, so a black Java is going to have a single comb. It's going to have kind of a square shaped body. Um, it's also going to have slate or black legs, um, but the bottom of their feet should be yellow. Um, and so those are kind of your main guidelines for um, a Java. They should also have, um, for a black Java, should have black feathers with a beetle green sheen. Um, and you really can see that when they're in the sun a lot. The Javas have different um, standards because there's actually different colorways for the Java. And that changes through history. So the, the original color of the Java is the black Java. Um, and then there's a white Java, and that no longer has a breed standard today. That was phased out. Um, it was too similar to another white chicken. And so they decided that it did not belong in the breed standard to avoid confusion. And then there's a model Java, which is a black Java. Originally, a black Java and the white Java were bred together to make this model Java that are white and black. So then there's a fourth color, um, Auburn. And it's mentioned in an 1851 book that we have, but the interesting part is it went extinct, but it didn't go extinct recently. It went extinct in the, in the 1870s, it's noted as being extinct and no longer existing. With the conservation efforts of the black Javas, um, they, they found the genetics hidden in the black Javas and they've been able to bring that color back today. Wow. And we actually, in our own flock, see the color popping up in certain pairings. Um, and so because we're going for black Javas, we, we don't keep those. So when we're talking about the breed standards for poultry, for chickens, they help create uniformity. So as you're breeding uh, chickens out, just like so many other things, genetics are coming up. So certain traits can pop up and certain traits um, can be hidden away. So we're talking about like a black Java. Black is a very dominant color when you're breeding, so it can jump up. Um, so if you're trying to get a white Java, you're gonna have to be a little bit more diligent about that. What can happen though is you can get too focused on one area and then traits are actually lost. In the instance of the black Java, something that we're working on here at History Acres is breeding up to the size. So over time, they became more of a show bird, I suppose, and, and there just was so few of them that their size has dropped below the breed standard. The breed standard says a rooster should be like 10 pounds. Um, not all of our roosters are coming out that way. They're coming underweight. So we need to do selective breeding to pull them back up to the standard of 10 pounds, which then also creates that market bird that they were so known for. Well, take us on a journey. They're wildly popular during the Civil War. They're almost extinct 20 years ago. How do we get from one to the other? I mean, really, there's a few things. You have the commercialization. They want things to grow faster. They want things to lay more eggs. And so they're crossing this breed with other breeds to kind of get those things. Um, you know, for example, our Dominiques that we have and our Javas that we have were crossed to make the Barred Plymouth Rock. Um, and that then lays more eggs than the Java, but is bigger than the Dominique. And it's a much kind of, um, desirable. much more desirable bird. Yeah. And then you start to also see issues with certain colors. 
Um, you know, I, we mentioned that the Auburn um, Java went extinct in the 1870s. Well, part of that was they were used to make the Rhode Island Red. And the Rhode Island Red just took over. So our standards can actually get in the way when we're talking about these heritage and endangered birds is when the standards made specifications between different breeds and pushed some varieties or some breeds to the background or just off the map. Um, and that's been challenging when we're talking about preserving some of this history. And that goes back into when they were starting the standards in, in the 1870s. Um, for instance, when we're talking about Javas, there was a white variety. And at some point they just decided the white variety of a Java was just the same thing as a white Plymouth rock. So we're gonna choose the Plymouth rock and we're removing the white Java entirely. Well, it just, it just took that variety off the map. And while we're talking about they were being replaced by these other breeds and why we're saying they, they have a place in a farmyard today, talking about like the predator awareness, being able to raise their young, those traits have been lost as these cross breedings have happened and they've gotten further away. And the fact that actually they nearly were extinct um, saved those traits. They weren't bred out of them. They didn't get lost because they were starting to spend all of their time locked up or all of their time in uh, a more commercial farm setting. They were, they've always just been allowed to be a chicken. So, well, take us on the city journey with the birds. It's so thinking about, we talk, keep talking about the Java and how great is a farmyard bird. However, they have a place in city and in town as well. You know, today a lot of like, well, I can't have roosters or people maybe not like chickens because they can be noisy like we often are hearing here. Um, but the black Java hens anyway, and the roosters are quiet as a rooster, but the hens, they're, they're nearly silent a lot of times. Um, when they're happy and they're just doing their chicken thing, they're very, very quiet. So someone that even lives more in a town or a sitting setting, city setting uh, could really benefit from having a black java. Okay, well, we've talked about them almost becoming extinct. We've taken them from the Civil War to the brink of extinction. Would one of you talk with me about how far down they went and their journey back to where they are today? No one's really talking about or even knows probably what a, a java chicken necessarily is, except for very few people. And one of those folks was Dwayne Urch. Um, he was a dedicated breeder uh, around poultry and he had what was con considered at that time like a pure black java flock, or maybe one of the last ones left. Um, thankfully, Garfield Farm out of Illinois, uh, they saw the importance of preserving this breed and their time frame was the 1840s so the black java fit perfect and very likely was at that farm originally and they worked with them to bring the numbers up they did genetic testing were able to confirm that this was a, a pure bred java bird um, and it grew from there um, it still isn't quite as um, proliferous as kind of the dominique is yet um, but it's getting an uptick and I'm seeing more and more people talking about it. We're pretty much extinct in the 1980s. We go forward, 1990s, recovery efforts taking place. We get into the 2000s. Um, at this point, we're probably, the numbers were coming up. They were actually on the Livestock Conservancy list as threatened. So they probably had over a thousand breeding birds and they just released a census recently that brought them down to a critical level so their numbers have dropped back down to probably under 500. So the, the, the fight is still on to make sure that they continue on to, into history. Standing here in the farmyard, why do you want this bird here? Yeah, so really you want this bird here for a few reasons. Um, they're amazing foragers, so your feed cost is low. They would far rather be out here running around eating bugs and grass and whatever they can find than being locked up with just a feeder. Another reason is they're phenomenal mothers. I have eight of them sitting on nests right now because they all went broody. So they're going to hatch chicks and raise them. Um, I don't have to do anything for them. They'll take them around. They'll teach them how to forage. The roosters, they'll, they'll leave the chicks alone. You know, they kind of look out for them. Um, and they're just amazing birds. 
Great. From a predator standpoint, they're the rooster's head on a swivel. They're paying attention. They're communicating to their hens if they think there's anything for a trouble standpoint. Some say the black actually makes them look like really large crows, and hawks <laughs> don't like crows, so that might help them out as well. And then why else would you want to... I, they, they taste amazing. And if you want to think about connecting with history and eat chicken that your ancestors would have had, this is the bird to seek out and get. And um, if you get a bird like this, what do you do with it? Yeah, so thinking about age is important. So if you look in 19th century cookbooks, you're going to see them talking about recipes that are meant for fryers and, and roasters. That That's not just talking about the style of cooking necessarily. That's pointing to the, the age and the size of the bird. A younger bird, you're going to want to be able to do a quicker method of cooking like frying. Older birds, you're going to want to roast low and slow. Um, because they're an, they take longer to mature, that 24 weeks, they actually have some additional fat in their, on their carcass as well. And that just creates amazing flavor and some juiciness and moistness. Um, the taste is much stronger. It's chicken that tastes like chicken still. And you just, once you have that, I don't know how you go back. And Jeremy, when you're cooking, how do you make a decision now between fryer and roaster? Is there an age line? Is there a timeline? What makes that distinction? Yeah, so sort of an, an age. Uh, Java and a lot of heritage breeds are going to be considered a, a full grown, ready for the table, 24, 26 weeks. But we're talking now they're, they're full size, they're full grown, so low and slow. Um, anything getting younger, so maybe 16 to 18 weeks, that's going to be something that you might be able to actually break down and, and fry, make some good fried chicken or throw on the barbecue. And Felicia, when you make eggs, let's talk about egg size and what happens when you bring eggs in. Yeah, so the Java lays a larger size egg, but they lay, you know, maybe 150 a year. And then when they're free ranging in the spring, their eggs can be so orange, they almost look green. Um, and that's really like when things are first coming up and they're nice and green and colorful in the spring. And then as summer goes on, they get a little less orange, but they're never quite as pale as a grocery store egg. And they taste really like rich and just full of flavor. And how are they size wise? Yeah, so they're about a large egg. Um, they're going to be smaller probably than what you would see in a grocery store. You know, today we're used to extra large eggs and jumbos and things like that. And so when when cooking some period recipes, you'll notice that they have, um, they have when they call for eggs and stuff, they're not calling for your jumbo sized egg in a store. They're calling for medium and large eggs because that's what they had available to them then. And how does that change a recipe? I mean, it, we had this instance where we made a, um, what was it? I think it was a, oh, it's bread. The spoon, spoon bread, bread pudding. The spoon bread pudding. And it was so eggy. I swear I was eating scrambled eggs. It was awful. And then we, that was years ago. And then we had our farm and we started getting farm fresh eggs. And really we came to the conclusion that the issue was because we weren't using the right eggs. Our eggs were far too big. So it was adding more egg than the recipe ever would have had originally, historically. Fantastic. Well, if somebody wants to become involved in Black Javas, what's your advice for them? My advice is to go to the Livestock Conservancy's website and they have a list there of breeders and whatnot where you can get breeding stock. You can get eggs for hatching or chicks and things like that um, and see if anyone's near you. If not, um, check out, you know, there's a Java, Java Facebook page. See if you can find someone on there. Um, the other thing is, you know, reach out to us. I'm happy to help you try to find somebody that has Black Javas. These are so critically endangered that the more people that start learning about them and raising them, it can only help. And so it was, you know, be diligent a little bit about it. This isn't the type of breed that you could go and just call a national hatchery and they're going to show up at the post office. You're going to have to find um, a, a breeder that's being dedicated to them and then have a little bit of patience while they're getting maybe their selective breeding done and getting their chicks hatched because um, it's not a commercial operation. But when you get them, it'll be worth it. Okay. So what if someone wants to help but doesn't want to raid, raise birds? Is there any advice you guys have? See if you can find a farm close to you that has them, buy eggs, buy meat birds, um, you know, really try to support the efforts of people that are doing the conservation of them. Um, if you know, I know there's a couple museums now, I think, that have Black Javas. Reach out to them, see, you know, what you can do to help them if they need funding to help forward their program or things like that. Great. And if you get 
kids involved and things like 4-H where they're showing birds and learning about birds and maybe introduce some of these heritage breeds as much as you can into those shows. Or when you see there's an APA show in your state or in your area, go check it out and support it because really those shows um, help provide in addition to the meats and the eggs another purpose for this bird to serve. Well, thank you guys both for hosting us out here and for bringing this story to us. We're happy to help bring it a little bit further for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for spending your time with Civil War Digital Digest. Look, as we talked about the idea for this episode, something struck me and I said to Jeremy on the phone one day, this may be the most important episode we've ever done. History meets great food meets extinction, meets biodiversity. We're forging a connection with history and we're helping the future. Give us a hand. We'll see you next time.